is Mark Andrejic of the Ukrainian Studies Program here at the Harriman Institute of Columbia University. Thanks a lot for joining us. Hope you're enjoying the oncoming spring wherever you are. If that's if you're in a part of the world that, that is getting that, you know, these days we never know we're being listened. Uh, today we have a wonderful event. We have a book talk by Yulia Ladigina of her book, Bridging East and West, Olga Kublianska, Ukraine's Pioneering Modernist, uh, which is this book I have right here, uh, published by the very fine University of Toronto Press uh, a couple of years back. Um, before we get to our talk, just a few programming notes uh, concerning our online events uh, for the Ukrainian Studies Program. Our next event, March 16th, this is actually not gonna be online, but we're co-sponsoring a Slavic Celebration Ukrainian Program, second in a series of three concerts by internationally acclaimed organist and recording artist, Gail Archer, and part of the series, a Slavic Celebration, Tree of Gail Archer Concerts. This one will be focusing on Ukraine and the, it will be taking place in person at St. John Baptiste Church. Uh, go to our website for more information. It's first come, first serve, so make sure you check that out if you're interested. On April 9th, we have an online presentation entitled The Original Maidan, Revisiting the Revolution on Granite in Con a Comparative Perspective by Olga Onuk from the University of, of Manchester. Recent um, anniversary of that uh, important uh, revolution in Ukrainian politics. Uh, and April 26th, 22nd, we have uh, another book talk. Uh, the book is Ukraine Calling, a kaleidoscope from Hromatsky Radio 216 to 2019. Uh, so it's a book that came out that's focusing on a radio program that was on the non-commercial um, Radio Hromatsky um, in Ukraine. So please come. We'll have Marta Dechok, Andriy Kulikov, and Oksana Smerichuk presenting then. Uh, today, uh, again, we'll be discussing uh, this, this um, monograph, uh, uh, and then we'll, after she's finished presenting, you'll have a chance to uh, give me questions. I'll pass them along to Yulia and uh, have a conversation. Yulia Ledigina is Assistant Professor of Russian and Global Studies at the Pennsylvania State University. Her research interests center on East European literatures and cultures and include 19th century Ukrainian and Russian literature, German and Russian intellectual history, Soviet and post-Soviet cinema, and state-sponsored informational warfare in contemporary Russia. Her current book project uh, has the preliminary title War on Reels, Cinematic Responses to the Ukraine Crisis, which examines the legacy of Soviet and Hollywood uh, war films in cinematic representations of the ongoing Russian-Ukrainian war. Before joining Penn State, Ladigina was a research fellow at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, a visiting assistant professor of Russian at Williams College, and a teaching assistant professor of Russian and humanities at the University of the South. So I give the floor to you, Yulia. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining our session today. And thank you, Marker, for the kind introduction and the opportunity to share my work on Olha Kubelanska. I have a few slides today to share with you. So uh, let me let me share my screen and we get started. All right. So Olha Kubelanska. Oh, technical uh, issues for a second. Olha Kopolanska, in my book, I argue that she's not only an, an emblematic figure in Ukrainian modernism, but also an important interlocutor for the social and aesthetic theories that have come to define European intellectual debates um, about science and culture and politics in the first half of the 20th century. I find Olha Kopolanska's um, daring experimentations with synthesizing diverse and often opposing currents of philosophical and political thought to be the most significant feature that defines her intellectual heritage. And uh, among her most uh, representative conceptual synthesis, I find um, the fusion of uh, a conservative view of humans bound by nature with a more progressive belief in the possibility of creating a new human being. Um, a commitment to understanding human nature by means of science and psychology for most, with the exploration of the unlimited possibilities of the will. Nietzsche's elitism and with 19th century 
uh, Russian radicalism and the faith and service of Christianity with the heroism of classical thought. To showcase this intricate intellectual work, I investigate the evolution of not only aesthetic choices and thematic foresee, but also the political discourses and philosophical ideas that found expression in Kovalanska's writings. In my approach, uh, rather than rehearsing various narratives um, about modernism as a radical response to 19th century bourgeois culture in the form of feminism or Nietzscheanism or fascism or an aesthetic of fragmentation, my book highlights the philosophical fissures and fusions inherent to turn of the century thought. So today I will do exactly that and elaborate on uh, several key synthesis of ideas that I find crucial for our understanding of Koblanska's place in Ukrainian cultural discourse, but also in understanding the scope and the rigor of her contributions to the broader discussions of aesthetic, philosophical, social, and ideological models generated by the European intellectuals of her time. But before we go there, let me share a few biographical facts and set up some historical and cultural context for our discussion. So, turn of the 20th century, the time when Central European intellectuals, particularly those from non-dominant ethnic groups, felt sharp pressures to navigate multiple and often uh, rival uh, cultural, social, and political projects. Caught between the bourgeois West and the agrarian East, these intellectuals experienced um, every day the confrontations of progress and, uh, and traditionalism of democracy and uh, of monarchy, of capitalism and of feudal economy, of religion and of se se secularism, of multiculturalism and of ethnocentrism. So uh, in this context, the case of uh, the Ukrainian intellectuals particularly stands out because of Ukraine's um, unusual geopolitical, geopolitical circumstances. At the time, Ukraine was split between Austria-Hungary and Russia, and in the mid-1910s, when Europe erupted in war, it became one of its main battlefields. So in this volatile historical moment, Ukraine hosted tensions among diverse mass movements, monarchism, socialism, Marxism, Bolshevism, and nationalism, those are just a few movements to name. As historians point out, the fact that Ukrainians were one of Europe's few ethnic groups to envision themselves as a nation, but who failed to assert their national statehood in the aftermath of the First World War, might be predicated on the disintegrated, irresolute, and overly confused nature of Ukraine's intellectual and political elite of the time. So this generation of Ukrainian intellectuals, Olha Kubranska is an emblematic figure whose writings, I argue, crystallize the contradictions of her time in the most exact form. Before elaborating on those contradictions, let me share a few relevant biographical facts about the author. Kobylanska was neither born nor raised a Ukrainian patriot, but rather grew up in a mixture of Ukrainian, Polish, and German cultures internalizing all three as irrevocable aspects of her identity. She was born on November 27th, um, 1863, in a small provincial town in the Bukovina province of what at the time was part of the Habsburg Empire. She grew up in a rather modest middle-class household and was the fourth child out of seven in the family of Julian and Maria Kobylanski. Her father was a minor administrative clerk and an imperial loyalist of Ukrainian noble descent. And like many Ukrainians um, in the 19th century Bukovina, he was partially Germanized, but remained in touch with his Ukrainian heritage. Uh, his mother came from, or her mother, Koblenska's mother, came from uh, the middle-class Polonized German family. And she remained faithful to her Polish cultural heritage, but she supported her husband in, in, in his participation in the Ukrainian community. And once married, she learned Ukrainian and converted to um, Ukrainian uh, Catholic denomination. This multicultural dynamic of Koblanska's family was a manifestation of the broader social um, trend. At the time, Bukovina was the most uh, heterogeneous of the Austro-Hungarian provinces, 
populated by Romanians, Ukrainians, Jews, Germans, Poles, and Hungarians. The cultural diversity of the region um, um, forced both um, local and imperial governments to design a working solution to the turbulent nationality question that dominated the political debates in Bukovina in the late 19th century. So in 1910, a new um, Austro-Hungarian constitution, an experimental franchise law, gave limited individual and auto autonomy to the six nationalities, guaranteeing their national self-determination. This political compromise uh, was designed to boost imperial loyalty of Bukovinians, and it certainly worked. As one contemporary scholar of Ukrainian nationalism um, observes, the political climate of the 1910s continues to resonate in contemporary Ukraine and in contemporary Bukovina. Here's, here's Chernivtsi on the map. That's the region where the region is located in present in Ukraine. And uh, as he argues, uh, that climate, that uh, legacy makes the Chernitsi region the only part of Ukraine where Ukrainian nationalism peacefully coexists, coexists with minority nationalisms. So living in Bukovina, let's go back to Kobylanska. Um, Olha Kobylanska, um, this was subjected to twin pressures. On one hand, uh, the pressure of diverse national revivals, but also there was a, um, quite a pressure to assimilate to the imperial culture where German was the dominant language of administrative, ad administration and to all kinds of cultural exchange. Both of these tendencies influenced the formation of Kobylanska's identity and informed her creative works, which, as I mentioned, are brimming with the all kinds of contradictions. And let me just give you a few examples here. Having completed only four years of elementary school in the Habsburg province of Bukovina, Kubelanska became one of the leading and vitally important Ukrainian novelists of her time, famous for introducing into contemporary Ukrainian cultural debates progressive Western ideas, such as social Darwinism, feminism, elitism, irrationalism, and Nietzsche's thought. Educated predominantly in German with minimal Ukrainian, she thrived as an innovative Ukrainian writer. Initially grounded in Western European culture of the turn of the century, she consciously chose to devote her life to the development of Ukrainian culture, which at the time was considered to be a marginal, rural, and second rate. And what's more interesting, she, uh, she succeeded in forging a new Ukrainian identity, empowered and confident in its cultural and political potential. So ironically, although it is hard to exaggerate the massive scholarly and critical words devoted to Kobolanska, her work um, and the complexity of her engagement with various um, philosophical and uh, ideological uh, bodies of thought at her time has been, um, has been addressed and acknowledged only in preliminary um, way. So here's the list of Koblanska's most known uh, novels, so the key novels. So she also wrote um, several cycles of short stories, too many to mention here. And uh, in the criticism of of her time and Soviet criticism and what's uh, more uh, important and engaging post-Soviet criticism, the most attention is devoted to her early works, the few, uh, the first couple of texts that address uh, feminism and Kubelanska's reception of uh, feminist thought of her time, um, also Kubelanska's reception of Nietzsche. And of course, uh, there is also the rereading of her key uh, text, uh, text that was defined as her key text, The Earth, which deals with, uh, with the peasants, uh, which was celebrated and canonized by the Soviet criticism. And uh, um, only one scholar uh, started looking into those connections from her early writings in the very last novel, Apostle of the Rebel. Um, and this is, this is where I, am, I really intervened with my research. And uh, I, I should highlight how grateful I am for the trailblazers in the post-Soviet um, 
criticism of Kobylanska, that's Tamara Hundarova and Marco Pavlishin, who did incredible work really um, pointing out to interesting uh, and starting the conversation about really interesting intellectual and aesthetic work that Kobylanska was doing at her time. But uh, um, what, what I do, and uh, here I color code uh, the text that I read closely and integrate into my discussion, um, I, I really argue that Kobylanska merits recognition not only for her national service and what she was able to bring to Ukrainian cultural uh, paradigm, but also for her daring synthesizing of diverse currents of European philosophical and political thought, which links her personal plight to the struggle of European intellectuals uh, seeking to make sense of their tumultuous time. And uh, here is the list of uh, those isms uh, that, uh, that uh, I in, in engage with and uh, investigate how exactly Kobylanska is using them, how she is um, adopting, what she is adopting, how she is processing um, a variety of uh, intellectual ideas and models and systems. And uh, I use some color coding to, to highlight that basically the main tension in her, um, in her um, intellectual output is between the rationalism and irrationalism. This continuous uh, oscillation between the individual and the mass. What, what's the connection there? How one influences the another seems to be one of the main, um, main um, ideas and questions that Kopelanska was continuously thinking and working through. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, this tension, this, this conflict, this uh, question seems to be very modernist in its nature, but at the same time, it is deeply rooted in the 19th century realist tradition. And uh, when we get to nationalism to make things even more diverse and complicated, let me just show um, another list of isms uh, that Kobranska was engaging in her work and trying to make a sense of all those austro Austrophilism, Russophilism, Ukrainophilism, right, populism and fascism, all those isms, all those uh, variations of national loyalties and um, um, allegations that she had to or tried to make sense to identify and define in her uh, works. So, at this point, I want to go ahead and talk about uh, some of the key syntheses uh, that I mentioned earlier. And the first uh, discussion uh, will be about uh, Kopelanska's reception of feminism in her early days. So as early as uh, um, the late 1880s, when Kopelanska first emerged on the Ukrainian literary stage, she proved to be an original and creative thinker who shrewdly muted her radical revolt against traditional patriarchal dogmas into an elegant liberal compromise. While agreeing with the leading European and Ukrainian theoreticians of feminism on the importance of education for women, she, like many Russian and German 19th century anti-socialist realist writers, rejected uh, the socialist ideological framework of feminism by dismissing its ideal of a self-sufficient emancipationist. Obolanska, Obolanska was uh, particularly critical of the socialist concept of free love and its class-based no, um, notion of equality. And this is, she's really in conversation with Natalia Koprinska. Here's her, uh, here's her portrait. She is uh, the leading and from the first theorist uh, of uh, feminism in uh, Ukrainian uh, tradition. Uh, they had a close relationship uh, in the late uh, 1880s. Kobrinska at some point even volunteered to be a mentor for Kobolanska, but very quickly that uh, relationship disintegrated into, into another set of tensions and conflicts uh, and uh, uh, led to professional rivalry at best. And uh, this relationship, I argue in my book, was actually the starting point for Kobolanska to develop very firm anti-socialist and anti-populist uh, beliefs. So basically, Kobolanska argued that for the very traditional society in Ukraine, um, that that was uh, not feasible. To, the, 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 this ideal of uh, of uh, emancipationist of the teacher who goes into the big world and asserts her independence. Well, there were not enough um, 
uh, support, neither on the level of government nor on the level of uh, traditional culture. And uh, according to Kobylanska, those um, idealistic uh, acts uh, would lead only to marginal or very minimal uh, results at best, but often resulted in tragic in tragic outcomes for young and married women. So what she did, she argued instead that um, um, that so be careful with when you're moving your papers there it's coming through in the microphone so okay i'm sorry it's okay i'm sorry thank you so much for uh, for the note uh, so what she did she uh, propagated instead intellectual and moral self-improvement as the only way to achieve women's liberation and advocated somewhat modernized yet traditional roles for women within the family as intelligent mothers, supportive spouses, and educated caregivers, right? So that's her uh, fusion, my first fusion, right? Education plus traditional family roles. And she comes with an interesting model. Uh, and this model represents a very, very provocative synthesis, which combines highly un un unconventional ideas in terms of the intellectual and theoretical vigor with the politically conservative and even a reactionary determination to rethink, reclaim, and reassert the value of tradition. And here she is really following Eugene um, Marlit, uh, Gottfried Keller from, from German uh, realist tradition, and Turgenev, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and Chekhov from, from Russian tradition. So this framework of conscientious motherhood or educated care given, giving allows me to challenge the classic reading of Kobolanska's first novel, the key text of this period, um, A Human Being, which was published in 1894. And I read its ending not as tragic and hysterical as uh, is a, a traditional reading in, uh, in criticism, but as assertive, forward thinking, and radically progressive. So for those of you who are not familiar with the novel, the main conflict here is the decision of um, an aspiring emancipationist but impoverished girl to marry, to marry a local forester who is not her intellectual equal, but whom she finds sexually uh, appealing and who can provide a decent living for her and her family. While past critics read Elena's decision, the heron's decision to marry her, um, to marry her um, encounter, her um, the person that she likes, but who is not really on par with her intellectually, while they read it as a failure to live up to her feminist ideals, I see it very much in line with, with her Darwinian and individualistic views that recognize the power of education and the importance of sexual satisfaction in a healthy mental life. So um, the key text that Kobolanska is in conversation here to, 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 to develop this uh, concept uh, are, on one hand, uh, Pisarev's Bees, uh, a very famous pamphlet where Pisarev um, criticizes the doctrinarian nature of, uh, of populist um, ideas and um, you know, points it out by, by describing uh, the worker bees and rejecting their self-sacrifice for the sake of the common good. But it's also the pamphlet when he talks about the importance of sexual gratification for a well-rounded development of any human being. And the second body of uh, works that Kambalanska is engaged in here is Freud's and Boyer's work on hysteria. And she was exposed to this works by her uh, friend, close friend, who happened to be uh, Kobrinska's, Natalia Kobrinska's niece, uh, Sofia um, Okunievska, who was studying medicine in Vienna and Zurich at the time, and who eventually became the first gynecologist, female gynecologist in the Austrian empire. So she brought these ideas, uh, and the two uh, young women discussed them prolifically through correspondence and face to face. Uh, so based, based on these materials and based on this perception um, of feminism, Kopolanska's um, idea of, uh, of conscientious education and uh, conscientious motherhood and caregiving, 
I, I see this heroine as a really new type who advocates an alternate venue for personal liberation, not the one propagated by socialists and uh, embedded in the image of Vera Pavlovna, the key heroine of Chernyshevsky cult novel, What is to be done, but a different type uh, that permits a liberal compromise, which should be read not as a betrayal of feminist views, but as an expression of sound judgment and healthy pragmatism. So the next synthesis of ideas that I'd like to address uh, is predicated on Kobolanska's reception of Nietzsche and his works. And I must point out that Kobolanska is perhaps one of the first European intellectuals, definitely one of the first in Ukrainian cultural par paradigm, maybe even further, we can push it further, uh, Slavic uh, cultural paradigm who reads, uh, who reads Nietzsche early on as early as late 1880s and early 1890s in the original first hand without influence of anyone who, who would impose vulgarized or um, kind of uh, readings of Nietzsche uh, as many Ukrainian intellectuals of her time did by following Trebyshevsky's rereadings or interpretations of Nietzsche's work. So, in the mid 1890s, Kobolenska infused her discussion of feminism with Nietzsche's thought in 19th century Russian radicalism, namely its dictum um, on the intellectual's duty to the people. And if you think about it, right, Nietzsche's elitism, populism, and feminism, that sounds almost uh, as, as an oxymoron. Um, but Kobelanska was early on able to see a lot of liberationist motives in Nietzsche's work that she uh, smoothly and elegantly adopted to a feminist agenda. And I argue that she is one of the first intellectuals who did it. I don't have enough data to claim her to be the first, but this is something that uh, European feminists started doing only in 1970s, right? Uh, Rereading Nietzsche is not necessarily a misogynist, but someone who who provided a lot of uh, interesting ideas that could be adopted to feminist agendas as well. So Kobolanska developed her new conceptual synthesis in her second novel, The Princess, and embedded it in the life story of her victorious heroine, Natalka Berkovicevna, who, after overcoming many social obstacles, achieves her own great noon, to use uh, Nietzsche's um, image. So notably, not only did uh, Kobolanska's heroine provide Ukrainian women with a new ideal for emulation, but she also reconfigured the traditional Ukrainian model of national martyrdom by forging an innovative myth of Ukraine's cultural and political revival. Contrary to the prominent uh, fin de siècle symbols of Ukraine's struggle for liberation, Kobolanska's new heroine and her life story uh, suggested that a successful future could be created not by drawing strengths from the ancestral past or the values of the Ukrainian peasant community, but by carrying out a cultural revolution and fostering a united and highly educated national elite. Is our key fusion feminism, Nietzsche, Russian radicalism, the key text, and, uh, and the uh, outcome, right? So well, how, how is she using it? Um, which she is presenting in a way, as I argue, as, um, as a, a, a version or a vision of Ukraine's national liberation. And let me share, share with you two passages from the novel where the heroine openly identifies with the Ukrainian people and comments on the nature of Ukraine's national movement. These are also two texts that where Kobolanska will follow up on the, this idea and this concept, will revisit it, will adopt it. And I will talk in a little uh, in a little bit about Apostle of the Rebel, the novel, as you see, published in 1936, that uh, Kobolanska spent a long time working on during the interwar period and adjusted to a completely different uh, culture and uh, um, and, and period in a the, in the very original way. So here's the first quote that I'd like to share with you. Um, this is something that uh, Natalka thinks uh, during, during her, her discussions with, uh, with her um, companions. There are people like nation, 
that's the characters of some people are often identical to the characters in individual nations. For example, you can expect with confidence that some people will act in one way or the other and that they can accomplish something immensely impressive and significant. There are also people of unique beauty that remain always fresh and unblemished with the pettiness of daily life. And on the contrary, they're exceptionally gifted people who nevertheless are entirely overwhelmed with sorrow. They want to achieve so much, but they rarely get there. They are doomed to suffer and grieve. I despise their song of eternal suffering as much as I despise the subservient and sickly anxious expression on the pale faces of our people. We have become weak because our remorse of the past and the sound of that forlorn melody have lulled our power to impotence. So the idea, but what's interesting here, right, while she points out to this inert nature um, of, uh, of uh, Ukrainian uh, people and the sorrow and the um, passivity in a way, she also um, establishes the connection and sees nations as individuals. And this is also the similar idea she is using later on when she draws the parallels between her own life and uh, the life of Ukrainian people as, as a nation. So let me read you another citation. It is impo impossible that the hour of the great noon won't strike for her and her people, that all their strengths won't suffice, suffice to eliminate their unique and unblemished beauty and their potential for independent existence. It is impossible. Their great noon must arrive. Yes, their grand, great noon will arrive despite all malicious and hostile circumstances that have been haunting her and her people for a very long time. There is still power in the world. There is still love. She feels how it overwhelms her and doubles her strengths so that she can fight her own battle and the battle of her people. Dun -dun. So this emphasis on Ukraine's independent existence connects Natalka's personal liberation to Ukraine's cultural and political independence and suggests that the heroine's story of self-discovery, intellectual growth, personal happiness, and professional accomplishment could be read as a program of action. And this is this is where we get to another very interesting uh, conceptual synthesis, I call it, um, because Kobylanska's fusion of Nietzsche's elitism with the national revival agenda brings her vision for Ukraine's national liberation close to the radical strand of thought that would become far more familiar as radical nationalism arose in 1920s and 1930s. Hence, it's only natural that in the interwar period, when Ukraine was aspiring to overcome its political fiascos of the early 1920s, Kopelanska adjusted her model to the new climate of moral nihilism by embracing a heroic tone, accepting a measure of militaristic rhetoric and affirming strong political rule, incorporating thereby some elements of fascist discourse into her work. And I have in mind here uh, Kobylanska's last novel, published in 1936, entitled Apostle of the Rebel, which once again succeeded in certain and in, in assuring Ukrainians uh, of their distinctive qualities and inspiring them for radical yet thoughtful action by giving them a new model and a new symbol um, of Ukraine's liberation. This time around, it was a robust and resolute, a resolute warrior with a strong political will. Um, and uh, his name was uh, Julian, uh, Julian Cesarevich. Uh, there is a resonance with uh, Julius Caesar in that name as well. So I argue that Kobranska's um, adoption of select elements of proto-fascist aesthetics could be identified follow Peter Sugar's conceptual model as anti-fascist fascism, a model that um, used fascist ideology not to endorse ethnocentrism or xenophobia, but to depict um, uh, something else and to direct public attention 
inward at Ukraine's state building project and the efforts to protect the country from external aggression. A brief footnote here in, is in place to point out that in my work, in my readings of Kopanska's last novel, I adopt a broad definition of fascism, draw, drawing on contemporary scholarship in gener generic fascism. And that's um, when I talk about Kopanska's work, I do not address a particular national version of fascism, but rather examine Kopanska's um, reception of a variety of uh, fascist discourses of her time, which could mean to her very variously and simultaneously the Romanian Iron Guard or Italian fascism or Dmitry Donsov's uh, political theories or the OUN's radical ideology, or it could mean uh, completely something completely, completely different, something that was still evolving, some um, concepts, images, and political practices, which she was trying to identify, process, and, um, and define or make sense in her own work. Um, by using uh, the scholarship on generic fascism and comparative fascism, and I uh, have Roger Griffin in mind here, and also using the work of Erin Carson, who was one of the first literary scholar to uh, apply um, the um, concepts from comparative studies of fascism to study and um, research a number of texts by French and British female writers. Virginia Woolf is one of them who employed elements of fascist discourse uh, or aesthetics to, to undermine the ideology that those works who identified with the movement were promoting. So in my work, I basically argue that Kobylanska is very much in, is in conversation with um, uh, with non-fascist and openly anti-fascist European intellectuals who engage with beliefs, themes, and images commonly found in texts by writers identify with fascism to discern from them a set of new rhetorical tools for a more effective rebuttal of the ideology uh, they represent. So um, it's also important um, to note that by uh, bringing that to the foreground, I argue that this novel is not really something that, that was uh, for so long discarded by Soviet um, critics because it didn't fit into Soviet um, ideology and later on by critics who uh, overlooked it as a minor work that is not worth um, looking into it, that it does not um, have that um, um, uh, very modernist, very experimented type of aesthetics. Well, vice versa, I argue that this work uh, actually represents something else, a different, uh, a different uh, aesthetic, a different strand in modernism. And I have another quote for you to share with you. That's from, uh, from the novel where uh, we can see how um, how Kobylanska adjusts that model of, uh, that she presented in The Princess uh, to a different climate, how that model of a certain new woman is, uh, is changed. And this is something that uh, the main character, Yuli Cezarevich, um, that talks about justifying chauvinism as a means of a resistance in the struggle for independence and as the response to the chauvinism, chauvinism of the enemy by referring to Helmut Karl von Moltke, a prominent German uh, field marshal and one of the greatest um, military strategists of the 19th century. So let me just read it to, to, to give you a sense how uh, the rhetoric is changing. He is now a warrior, and he often recalls the words of his professors and military instructors who used to say that uh, they have always been wars and there will always be wars, and that he, as an individual, would either win them or fall defeated. Yes, he is a warrior, an apostle of the sword. He remembers one passage from Moltke that has been forever engraved in his heart. Military service is a big burden, which brings to mind the worst periods of ancient slavery. Without this burden, however, European society would fall prey to diverse barbaric elements. The moral influence of the military regime on the people characters has therefore such immense value that one can hardly exaggerate it. He thinks about the history of different nations, their rebellions, and the history of Ukraine. 
his heart fills with sorrow when he thinks that he does not have a country of his own, independent Ukraine, and then he cannot be proud of it like other nations are proud of their countries. He would like to serve his country, but, his, but first he needs to accumulate strength, both physical and intellectual. So Julian's reference um, here um, endorses struggle and justifies violence as a necessary and even an ethical act that cannot be expelled from history. According to Julian, the military not only protects communities from external enemies, but also plays a key role in organizing the people with a common cause into a disciplined formation with hierarchical command structure. His military analogy likewise positions a virile man, the very hero Julian eventually becomes, as the principal driving force of history and one of the main symbols of nation's strength and progress. Such an image of a new man stands in sharp contrast not only to Kobylanska's earlier images of the new Ukrainian women, but also to her dramatic descriptions of the dehumanizing experiences of war in her cycle of short stories on First World War, a cycle which I argue elsewhere in my book comprises a collection of valuable cultural documents that offer an, an original perspective on the common European experience of 1914-1918. But this contrasts also suggests that although it's unlikely that Kobylanska, um, and as an eyewitness of some of the most brutal battles of First World War on the Eastern Front, would promote aggressive military action, she had, um, she had a clear understanding of the political situation in interwar Europe and consciously chose, along with many Ukrainian intellectuals, political and cultural leaders of the time to advocate authority, organization, and strong military leadership as necessary measures to avoid the mass slaughter of Ukrainians in the new total war, which by 1936 was very easy to foresee. So the last point or the last topic that I want to address today is uh, Kobylanska's response to, to the continuous populist pressures, to the criticism from the populist camp uh, of Ukrainian um, critics and, um, and intellectuals and the most uh, prolific and uh, the most um, uh, engaging critic uh, that uh, um, really gave her a lot of trouble was Sergei Efremov. Uh, he, he put a lot of pressure on Kobylanska. He demanded that she must address the, uh, the topics of peasants and pay attention, more attention to Ukrainian village. Kobylanska was very hurt by, by that type of criticism, yet uh, she was, uh, she was quite a character, she was very creative, she was very engaging and um, found a way to push back. And uh, in response to that pressure from Yefremo and, uh, and other populist critics, she crafted a series of rustic works in the late in 1890s, in which she exposed the populist uncritical glorification of the Ukrainian village and the natural person, the Ukrainian villager. So instead of dwelling on the material conditions and ethnographic peculiarities of everyday peasant life, which was a common practice in the 19th century Ukrainian populist tradition, she, um, she um, concentrated on the emotional and cognitive lives of her peasant characters, projecting them um, as natural beings, pristine in their culture, but often chaotic and ruthless in their behavior. Um, so, um, while depicting her characters as unfit for any social or political struggle, Kopolanska nevertheless drew attention to their downtrodden position, and that's what allowed Soviet critics to canonize her as the her author of the people, as the prime psychologist of, uh, of Ukrainian peasants, and allowed uh, critics, Soviet critics, to preserve her uh, archive and preserve her works, keep some, at least some of her works accessible to, to the readers. She also acknowledged on many occasions that um, 
the peasant's spiritual authenticity and unconventional insight into uh, broader ge geopolitical issues are very, uh, very applicable and useful in making comments on the experiences, especially during World War One, and expressing those, conveying those dramatic experiences and transmitting also the, uh, the disintegration of the multiple loyalties and multiple identities of Western Ukrainians during the major global conflict. At the time when Ukraine was discarded as a non-historical nation, and in the aftermath of which um, the Ukrainian question was neglected altogether. So when I deal with, with this uh, cycle of uh, Kobolanska's works, I basically focus mostly on the formalist, uh, formal elements of her, um, of her writing, pay attention to um, internal monologues and how she externalizes the, the lives the, 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 of, of her present characters. But I also, another thing in addition that I um, contribute to already an, an existing body of criticism on these works, um, I, I provide them uh, the comparative study of Koblenska's novel, major novel of the period with um, uh, with Emile Zola's novel of the same uh, title, where I show how Kobolanski rejects naturalism altogether and prioritize, uh, prioritizes psychological studies over uh, claims um, on, on hereditary and also rejects um, Zola's idea of regenerative uh, powers of the earth. She basically um, believe, does not believe that the earth has that, that the village could be the new platform for for whatever cultural regeneration of Ukrainian people. And at this point, I have to sum up my, my presentation. One thing I want to um, highlight is that although Kobolanska continuously revised the conceptual underpinnings of her works proceeding from feminism and social Darwinism to Nietzsche's elitism and anti-populism, and then to political militarism and radical nationalism, she remained uncompromising on a cluster of key principles. Her dedication to Ukraine's cultural and political regeneration, her celebration of Western culture, and her firm repudiation of ethnocentrism, xenophobia, on any other type of heterophobia remained immune to all changes in her cultural, social, and political environment. Throughout her career, she saw the denationalization of the Ukrainian intellectual elite as one of the main threats to Ukraine's national project and deemed anything or anyone who jeopardized the well-rounded education and solidification of the Ukrainian elite as a villain. As a result, Kobolanska often portrayed Poles, Romanians, Russians, and occasionally Jews as morally inferior foes to Ukraine's national revival. She, however, never positions the Ukraine's problem in exclusively Polish, Romanian, Russian, or Jewish terms. What is more, she saw the main threat to Ukraine's nation-building project not in the external force, but in the lack of organized Ukrainian civil society and strong political leadership. That is why she is justly famous for giving her readers both um, appealing images of the new Ukrainian men and women and for scandalizing the Ukrainian public with the depiction of ruthless, self-centered, and often feeble-minded Ukrainian peasants, and no less brutal and coarse Ukrainian denationalized provincial intelligentsia, the two types of spiritually and morally corrupted Ukrainians that Kubilanska criticized the most. I will stop here. Thank you so much for, for extra minutes for allowing me to finish my points and we'll open to questions. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Yulia, for your, presenting uh, your book. And thank you for writing the book. It's 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 a wonderful. I learned a lot about Olya Kobylianska, uh, especially about later later period of, of her work. Um, the way you uh, analyze uh, Kobylianska's modernism and, and her view of Ukrainian national culture, uh, oftentimes it seems to me that it's akin to some of the things that Ukrinska Khata was trying to develop, uh, her contemporaries, basically, uh, as far as their, how they saw you, how Ukrainian 
national culture is supposed to revive and what's the role of culture in the revival of Ukrainian nation. Can you, and you, and you do talk about them in a the book. Uh, can you mention a bit more about how Okrinska Khata and Kobolyanska, how they coexisted? Did they, what points they agreed on, what points they argued about? Or did, they, did they have a relationship? Uh, well, um, I think the main point is that uh, Kobolanska is starting talking about it a little bit earlier that Kobolanska, uh, Ukrainska Hata comes to, uh, comes to prominence, right? She is published, uh, publishing her novel, uh, The Princess, where she basically lays out her concept and her ideas in 1896. That's uh, from, from what I remember, I, I, about at least, at, at least a decade before, before other Ukrainian intellectuals picked up and modernists, right? So that, that was one of the dominant modernist uh, strands, uh, emphasis on, uh, on culture, emphasis on Ukrainian intelligentsia, uh, I basically, what I'm doing is saying that she was she was the first and we need to give her credit. And uh, she was the one who inspired her fellow Ukrainians in, in looking into that direction and introduced the ideas, Nietzschean ideas, um, and was able to fuse the um, Lavrov's dictum on the intellectual's duty to the society with something more. So she's the one uh, asking, the first one uh, demanding the culture for, for intelligence and not only for the peasants, uh, the type of literature that will inspire intelligentsia. Um, but um, she did not have much interaction. People reached out to her and wrote and published her works, but um, she was really disconnected. And that's partially why she was able to uh, come up with very interesting ideas and resolutions because she was disconnected from, uh, from Lviv and Galician intellectuals. She was just on her own up in the mountains in Bukovina reading progressive literature, digesting that literature on her own and employing it to how she saw it fits. So I think that's that's the main distinction. But of course, she she supported um, uh, young modernists reached out to her. She she was very much at the middle of their conversations. Yeah, it's it's amazing how, how influential she was and a forerunner and you know another group of young modernist poets, the Molodá Musa, uh, mm -hmm. looked at her not so much for that, but for her decadence, and they were inspired by her muse. Uh, it's fascinating, uh, her, her, her imprint on what was happening then and later. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, recently, of course, uh, we've been celebrating the 150th anniversary of Lesio Kodinska's uh, birth, and, uh, you know, it's all over the internet, and there have been some wonderful uh, initiatives and developments and innovative ways of, of, of celebrating Lesio Kodinska who was a contemporary of Kobylanska. Uh, my question is, did you notice that Kobylanska uh, show up in any of these mentions uh, that they were going on? All last the time, <laughs> more often than, than, than <laughs> I wanted them to mention it. And unfortunately, that's something that I point out in my book. And I uh, specifically walk away, step away from Kobylanska's personal life. I only use just minimal of what, what's important for my argument is that um, quite often that, that that discussion of the relationship of two writers takes away from actual tax and intellectual work of, that both are doing and the support that both are providing uh, to each other. They were definitely intimate friends. They found the kindred spirits in each other and uh, um, their friendship really enhanced uh, their, their creative output on both ends. But quite often it's really, it's really frustrating to see how in a discussion with um, prominent uh, um, scholars and cultural figures, quite uh, often the conversation is hijacked and you spend 20 minutes talking about whether they had a lesbian relationship or not. That's, that's really uh, disheartening. But at the same time, uh, I, I've been really excited to read some of the new scholarship that Tamara Hunderova offered in her rereading of uh, the correspondence of the two uh, of the two writers and her insights how that relationship really was uh, transmitted into Lesia Ukrainska's um, Lisova Kisnia. Um, that many, many of those intimate uh, and uh, conversations uh, made its way into one of the um, probably exciting and important works in um, Lesia Ukrainska's uh, literary overall. And I must, I must confess that the more I listen to, to a number of wonderful presentations, the more I'm getting inspired to go ahead and, and research uh, uh, Lesia Ukrain Ukrainska's um, uh, 
output and maybe in the future write a book on her as well. It only makes sense, right? I already have so much from, from the period with Kobolanska, so it could be the next project. So okay, wonderful, thank you. We, I want to get to questions. Uh, Anna Prosek, who presented her book, uh, her latest monograph about a year ago, has a question. Was Kobolanska familiar with the writings of Giuseppe Mazzini? and the ideology promoted by young Europe, in other words, uh, liberal nationalism. Her ideas of individuality of each nation, cultivation of a national elite working on behalf of the people seem to coincide with the ideas of the founder of young Europe. The problem seems to be that in our age, even scholars tend to identify every form of nationalism with fascism. Mm -hmm. So um, I, don't have the exact um, exact archival confirmation um, and the mentioning of the group uh, because that archive still remains closed to, to scholars. Her archive from 1920s, personal diaries, personal correspondence, uh, they're still in, um, in care of Kobolanska's um, grandson. She adopted her niece and raised her and her family, so she can. Uh, that's that's what that archive is, and it's not op open to scholars. But she was reading and following the developments, European developments, uh, very closely through a number of periodicals and publications. She was aware of the discussions. Um, and uh, that's, that's what she was trying to do in her last novel, to make sense, to dig through a variety of things. Um, and on one hand, through her experiences of World War I, she could not but embrace certain elements uh, at the time where Europe basically was polarized by two dominant ideologies, fascism on one hand and variety of nationalisms um, with uh, different degrees of radical ideologies and Bolshevism on the other hand, where in 1930s, uh, that was not an option for many Ukrainians, right? That, uh, that uh, really, um, was uh, was a very tough choice. Um, and she was trying to, to make sense out of uh, the aspirations of her compatriots. Um, so yes, and uh, but I don't have um, much archival um, evidence. She was aware of a variety of different national movements and she was exposed to those um, in Bukovina, which was taken uh, over Romania at the time. And she, she lived in a very, under very harsh repressive regime where her apartment was searched almost regularly. Her, um, she, she barely survived basically in, in, at that time. That's interesting you mentioned that last, uh, thank you for answering the question. Uh, what the presence of uh, Romanians in her work, uh, you know, what, she lived, like you said, she, she lived in, in Bukovina her whole life and, uh, and she obviously interacted. Uh, I was always, I haven't read Kublianska as, 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 as detail as you have, but I was always, I always thought there'd be more Romanians <laughs> in her work. And I was always, uh, can you maybe comment on that uh, and how she addresses them at all or doesn't? Uh, very, very marginal characters and uh, mostly in her early work. There were, and, and they're somewhat negative, not necessarily positive, but not malicious per se. It is surprising because, because she actually spoke Romanian fluently. She was, uh, um, she was, um, uh, very much in tune with with the multicultural environment in Bukovina, but that also the case why um, quite often, it, especially in early Korea, that didn't really matter much. If we look at the original German uh, German manuscript of the princess, we have only twenty pages that survived. There are no ethnic markers whatsoever. When she was writing for European audience, that didn't really matter. It's only by uh, adjusting and translating her work into Ukrainian uh, context, into Ukrainian English, when she made a decision that this is my target audiences, she started adopting some ethnic markers, but those that would resonate with Ukrainian audience. And her main audience was in, Gal in Galicia, right? So Poles were, <laughs> Poles were the, 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 the evil ones. So the Romanians didn't matter as much for, for her audience, either in the Russian side of Ukraine or in, in Galician side. That's why those characters didn't make um, into, into uh, uh, such, a, such a presence in her work. That's, that's my speculation. It was a very, she 
was very pragmatic. She was very shrewd how she, she handled her, uh, her publications and her work. So the goal was not necessarily to capture all the diversity, but was to reach out to your, uh, her potential readers. That was the goal for, goal for her. Yeah, and as you point out throughout your book, she was really aware of her potential audience and, and kind of geared towards them at different mm -hmm. stages of her life. Uh, we have time for one more quick question. Uh, was there any place for religion and spirituality in the Ukraine national reawakening and revival? <clears throat> I assume in Kobylanska's. Uh, Absolutely, she her her all her creative uh, works they they framing with with religious metaphors with religious uh, uh, symbolism and uh, especially the last uh, the last um, novel right, that I mentioned in Apostle of the Apostle of the Rebels. She basically adopts what, what many scholars um, identify as the key um, conceptual premise of fascist ideologies. That's the mixture of uh, Nietzsche, Caesar, and Christ, right? So a little bit of a religious uh, narrative, a little bit of heroism of classical thought and Nietzschean ideas. If you think about her character, Julian Cesarevich, the name itself, right, refers to Caesar. We also have a number of dreams with Caesar appears to uh, Julian and inspires him to, to dedicate his youth and his skill to, to Ukraine a national project and then Julian himself first he starts as a as a priest uh, he he but he gives up on his studies and becomes a warrior and picks up a sword because that was the time of the day and uh, and priests come in different uh, in different ways in Kobolanska's work some of them are very reactionary and old school right and represent uh, quite often populist um ideology that uh, work with the people for the people dedicate themselves for the for the people and there is a lot of recognition in that in Kobolenska's works but at the same time um, she prioritizes something else, right? Being a Nietzschean, she has a very, very complicated relationship with uh, organized religion. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Yulia. We've run out of time. I just want to uh, thank everyone that, uh, that tuned in uh, today and and thank you, Yulia, for, for your wonderful talk. I, I want to encourage people to, uh, there should be a link listed uh, where you can find out how to purchase a copy of this book. Uh, I look forward to hosting you sometime soon with your new research uh, on the war in, in the east of Ukraine. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Marco. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Best.